Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new here. This month on this channel, we're talking about heartbreak. And what I want to talk about today specifically is how having an insecure attachment style can keep us stuck in a cycle of choosing partners who are wrong for us. A very common question that comes up in the attachment space is, how do I know if I'm just incompatible with someone versus if it's my attachment style that's messing up our relationship? And I think that a lot of the time when this gets asked, the real answer to the question is both, because our attachment systems have a tendency to keep us choosing romantic partners who are wrong for us. And when I say wrong for us, I mean fundamentally incompatible with us in some major way. Today, we're gonna to go over why that happens, why it is that if we have insecure attachment styles, we might repeatedly find ourselves drawn to people who we aren't a natural fit with, as well as how secure people view relationships and how they suss out compatibility. So we're gonna look first very quickly at how this problem tends to develop. And the thing that we're specifically gonna hone in on the most is the role of authenticity in the dating process. So those who air securely attached tend to lead with authenticity and compatibility is the number one thing that they are looking at when they're sussing out who might be a good or bad partner for them. And this is almost the opposite for those who air insecurely attached. The reason for that is because those who air insecurely attached tend to have a very core wound that got formed when they were incredibly young around authenticity. So it's actually something that they will be suppressing unconsciously in the dating process, which makes it really hard to suss out compatibility. I do have a video on attunement that actually goes over this process in a little bit more depth if you're wanting more from it, but for now I will give you the quick version. So first we're gonna look at what happens for the securely attached person that gives them a secure experience of dating, and then we're gonna look at the opposite. So when a secure person comes into this world as a little helpless baby, they have no choice but to express themselves completely authentically to their caregivers. And this is the exact same starting point that insecurely attached people start from. But in the case of those who grow up secure, what happens when they express their emotions authentically is those emotions get seen and understood by their parent and mirrored back to them. So what the child learns through that is it's okay to be me, it's okay to have needs and it's okay to express them at the exact volume that they exist. So this leads to the belief that if I am my authentic self in relationships, my needs get seen and met and I can stay in connection with other people, which leads to the formation of secure attachment. When we have a secure attachment style, we lead with authenticity in dating. Because again, that model of intimate relationships that we internalized at a very young age included us leading with our authentic feelings and thoughts and getting accepted for those. So now when we're approaching dating relationships as securely attached people, that is once again, what we're putting out there. Because we're leading with authenticity, we are more likely to be finding compatible partners who are also sharing their authentic selves with us. That doesn't mean that this process does not take time. It does not mean that it's easy to find partners who value the same things as us and who fit neatly into our lives, but the process is not going to be contaminated by some of the things we're gonna talk about next. Now we're gonna look at what happens as an insecurely attached person is growing up. So we start from that very same place. You come into the world as a young child who has no idea what to do other than express their needs authentically. However, for those of us who are insecurely attached, for whatever reason, we learned authenticity is not the way to get my needs met. At some point, we had our authentic expression of self rejected in our intimate relationship, which is with our caregivers when we are children. This could mean they either reject displays of vulnerability and pain, or maybe they reject displays of autonomy and strength because they're uncomfortable with the idea of their child not needing them in some significant way. So some part of our identity, if this is the case for us, becomes something we learn we have to hide or obscure in order to be in connection with other people in an intimate way. And this leads to the development of a false self or a kind of social mask that we learn to wear around other people in order to get acceptance. 
And this mask runs so deep because it's based upon what we have repressed within ourselves and failed to develop that we might not even be conscious of the fact that we're wearing it. But at this stage, for most people who air insecurely attached, there is at least some conscious awareness of the fact that to be in connection with other people, we believe we have to be operating based on some form of relational strategy. So we're thinking both unconsciously and in some cases consciously about how should I act so that other people like me? What sides of myself should I show to people and what sides of myself should I hide? And it's not that the secure child is never going to do this. To an extent, this is just part of being a social being in the world. But the insecure child is going to do this right down to the essence of who they are. So connection is going to be something that is deeply assumed without that assumption ever being questioned consciously to be something that is only available to us if we behave in a certain way that is not entirely authentic. So at this point, we have an insecure attaching style. We are navigating the world in some way using an unconscious strategy to get connection rather than using unfiltered authenticity to get connection. So particularly when we are approaching dating relationships or any sort of intimate connection, we're going to have whatever strategy we have internalized is the way to make people like us super online. If you're anxious, this might look like hyper fixating on what the other person wants from you and trying to mold yourself into the kind of person that you think they would like. If you err more avoidant, this might look like focusing really hard on how you can stay self-sufficient and independent so that nobody is going to see any of your deeper needs and grow disgusted by you. And again, all of this is happening on an unconscious level. The problem is that when we are picking people to date from a place of strategy and masking, they don't know who we authentically are. And so it's very easy to end up in relationships with people who we are not at our core compatible with because we ourselves often do not know ourselves deeply enough to be aware of who we are at our core, never mind how we could communicate that to someone else and pick compatible others. So what we're gonna do next is a bit of comparing and contrasting between what a secure relationship looks like and the kind of founding principles of one versus what an insecure relationship tends to look like and which principles tend to underlie those relationships. And the reason we're gonna do this is not to shame ourselves over the way that we form relationships, but to just start getting an idea of how things could be different. And if we are on that journey of earning secure attachment, hopefully this offers some hope and encouragement around where you could take your relationships next. So one of the biggest differences that I wanna draw our attention to right away is the difference between how insecurely attached people tend to unconsciously view relationships versus the way securely attached people do. When we are insecurely attached, we necessarily have unmet developmental needs. And those unmet needs, whether that is the need for deep emotional mirroring or whether that is the need for mentorship, those needs are unconsciously driving us when it comes to our partner choices. So if I feel at my core, like I am not that competent or capable of navigating the world on my own, I'm going to be unconsciously searching first and foremost for a partner who seems incredibly competent and incredibly skilled at navigating the world, enough so that they can mentor me in that capacity or completely take care of me. And if I am someone who is completely out of touch with my emotional needs, I am subconsciously going to be searching for a partner who over emotes and over functions in the realm of proximity seeking so that I don't have to do any of the emotional labor that I quite frankly don't know how to do that is required for keeping somebody close. So insecure relationships are generally driven from a place of lack unconsciously. We're looking at how do I find somebody who over functions in the area where I am under functioning so that as a unit, we can feel whole. So this is about kind of bringing ourselves up to a baseline through relationship rather than being at baseline when choosing partners. And looking at relationships from this lens makes us quite loss averse because we don't wanna do anything that increases the pain we are already in. So we're gonna be looking predominantly 
for partners who we think are going to help us achieve what we need to get to that emotional baseline, irregardless of whether or not they are a great fit for us. Now, let's contrast this with what a secure person looks like when they're forming a relationship. Because securely attached people tend to feel as though their baseline needs are being met, either through self-regulation or through community and other support networks they have, they are consciously choosing partners from a place of desire. So they're thinking not, how do I get myself to a place where I feel okay, but now that I feel okay and enjoy my life and the people in it, what else do I want to add? And what type of a person might be interested in exploring the same type of relationship that I'm interested in having? And when we have that baseline state of stability, both in ourselves and in our social networks, we're able to take a lot more risks. So I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine when I was at the beginning of a new relationship where I said to her, well, I'm afraid of losing some of the security that I've built in my life as a single person. My life functions really smoothly. I really like the way everything is. And there's a part of me that's kind of resistant to any of that changing. And she looked at me and went, well, you can't be in the energy of desire and the energy of safety at the same time because desire is by nature the act of extending beyond ourselves and trying to align with something that we are not yet aligned with. So it is inherently unsafe if we define safety as that which we know to be predictable and reliable and that's already available to us. And I really liked that framing because I think that when we are in a secure place in our lives, we're most able to choose desire and to choose a little bit of instability knowing that we have the skills to eventually restabilize. So because we're approaching the entire thing from a place of pre-established security, we're able to take a few more risks in our dating lives. We don't necessarily have to settle down and get really serious with the first person who meets some of our needs and who makes our lives a little bit easier. Our lives already feel resourced, so we're able to experiment more and get clearer on what it is that we want and who is going to fit the best into our lives before we make any serious decisions. And what helps a lot in this process is knowing ourselves deeply, which brings us to the next point. When we are insecurely attached, in some major area, we have a deep disconnection from our sense of self. Again, because we have been trained to believe who I am is not okay, and I need to hide or mask some part of myself in order to show up in my relationships, we tend to spend a lot of time thinking, who should I be? Who is the version of me that would be the most lovable? And then we pick partners based on who the person we think we should be would date. The problem is that very often the person we think we should be is not the same as the person we authentically are. And when we look at how secure people choose partners, they are choosing from a place of who am I and who would authentically fit with me? Because they've had that experience of getting deeply mirrored at a young age, they tend to have a pretty strong idea of who they are, what their unique interests are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what they would like to spend their time doing, and what their core values are in life. And there isn't a lot of shame wrapping up any of those things for them. Whereas in an insecurely attached person, a lot of those authentic needs and wants we're going to feel a lot of shame over and try to hide. But because the secure person does not feel chronic shame over their core identity, they're more likely to lean fully into the things that they really like and that bring them to life. And then those things make them seem very attractive to compatible others. As opposed to if you are insecurely attached, you might be trying with everything you have to hide your core essence. And so then you come off as kind of incongruent when you're in relationship with other people. You're denying parts of yourself and those parts that you're denying might actually be the things that if you stepped into them would make you the most attractive to other people because those are the parts of you that you are most alive inside of. So a lot of the time we have insecurely attached people resisting and hiding the very parts of themselves that would make them seem the most desirable to people who they would be compatible with. And we have secure people really highlighting and stepping into the parts of themselves that are going to make them the most attractive to people who value similar things. 
And so this makes it a lot easier for secure people to source partners who they are good fits with because what they're putting out there is what they want to get back. And the exact opposite tends to be true for those of us who air insecurely attached. We're putting out something inauthentic to us and then we're getting that thing back. And because this is all a subconscious process, we might be really confused as to why we are not happy. Now we're gonna look at what happens when you get into that relationship as an insecurely attached person. One of the biggest unconscious functions for insecure relationships so relationships between two people who are not securely attached is that it allows both people to collude in avoiding themselves. So what do I mean by this? If there is some part of me that I think is disgusting and bad and unworthy, let's say I think that I have to be practical all of the time or else everybody is going to judge me and think there's something wrong with me. Who I am going to be drawn to is a partner who sees me the way that I think I need to be seen in order to be accepted. So I'm going to be most drawn to partners who don't notice the parts of me that are actually pretty creative and interested in other ways of doing things. So the parts of myself that I am avoiding, my partner is going to be accidentally helping me avoid because they're happy to accept my mask without questioning it and vice versa. If I partner up with someone who has learned to think of themselves as helpless in order to stay in connection with people, and I need to see myself as very capable and competent to stay in connection with people, I'm not gonna try too hard to push my partner into autonomy because we are both serving the roles that we believe we need to play in order to stay in connection with people. Versus in a secure connection, there's going to be a lot of mutual exploration. Because secure people don't grow up being fearful of any particular part of themselves, they're able to accept and encourage all parts of their partner to come out. So a lot of the time in insecure relationships, there's this belief on behalf of the more avoidant leaning partner that if anyone saw my struggle, they would leave. And there is an unconscious belief on behalf of the more anxious party, if anyone saw my strength and knew that I didn't actually need them, I would be abandoned and left alone. Because again, both of those things were true for each person in their early life. But with securely attached individuals, struggles and strengths are seen and nurtured or celebrated inside of the self. And so they look to be present with their partners in both of those areas as well. So often if a secure person dates an avoidant person, the avoidant person is going to become quite dysregulated if the secure person with every good intention tries to draw attention to any of the areas in which they're struggling or might need support. They might see that as an attack rather than an invitation to learn more about themselves and explore the ways where they could receive help. Or if the secure person is dating a more anxious person, the more anxious person might become very distressed if the secure person is trying to point out the areas where they don't actually need help or to point out the ways in which they could increase their autonomy. So in the case of the secure couple, if both parties are very open to exploring and learning about themselves on a deep level, it's gonna be a lot easier to figure out what matters to them, what their values are, what they want out of a partnership, because there's a really easy and open dialogue for exploring all of that stuff. So if they find that they're incompatible in certain ways, that's probably going to be discovered sooner than later, so the partnership isn't gonna to get to five or 10 years down the line before they realize that they have fundamentally different values because there is very little that's off the table in terms of discussion. Versus when you're dealing with a mutually insecure couple, there are a lot of things that are gonna be triggering for either one to look at. So certain values or needs or beliefs are gonna be really heavily buried and might not come out until five, 10, 20 years down the line, maybe in some moment of overwhelm where finally someone screams the truth that they've been suppressing for many, many years because they fear that it would threaten the relationship. And the thing is, it might be a truth that actually does threaten the relationship. But again, a secure person would have considered a truth that threatens the relationship as a very important thing to bring up and discuss because they're more willing to have a relationship end early if the person is not compatible with them. Because again, they don't see connection and intimacy as a scarce resource. So if they're not compatible with someone, they assume it's not that personal. We should just free ourselves up to go out and find other people we're compatible with. 
whereas this is not necessarily the worldview that those who are insecurely attached are dealing with. So what we're getting at with a lot of this is the idea that we choose what we are familiar with, not necessarily what is the best or most appropriate choice. So when we are insecurely attached, we're going into relationships that feel familiar based on that base model we have of ourselves and others. So if we're anxious, we tend to feel like I'm not okay. I'm not really able to take care of myself, but other people are okay. And there's someone out there who can come along and help me or complete me in a way that is going to finally make me feel safe in the world. And on the flip side of things, you have that avoidant mindset of I am okay, I'm regulated and able to take care of myself, often because all of the emotional needs that are more vulnerable are being deeply suppressed, but you don't know that consciously if you are avoidant. But other people are not okay and they need help and support. So I'm unconsciously looking for a partner who can't take care of themselves because it reinforces my worldview of I am okay, others are not okay, and vice versa with the anxious party. Now, the secure individual has the worldview, I am okay, and other people are okay. So I know how to tend to myself emotionally and take care of my practical and physical needs. And I am looking for a partner who knows how to do the same. And so when each person goes out into the dating world, they're going to go out with their blinders on. Remember all of our connecting skills. So everything we know about how to get and stay in an intimate relationship is deeply entrenched by that cycle we went through when we were young. So insecurely attached people look for the inauthenticity that feels familiar to them and securely attached people look for the authentic, intimate connection that feels familiar to them. And I want to pause here and just say that this is one of the areas where it's actually quite intuitive to understand how you can cross over from the insecure side of the fence to the more secure one. So if what feels familiar is game playing, mask wearing and inauthenticity, how do we start giving ourselves more experiences, of our own authenticity getting accepted so that that can be the thing we form memories around that then becomes familiar to us. This can be something like finding a counselor who's securely attached and just learning and logging inside of our bodies what it feels like to co-regulate with a person who is secure. And then maybe finding support groups where we're able to be honest and authentic well, knowing we're not going to get shamed in response because it's an intentionally contained environment for emotional expression. And then maybe we're able to find communities or form friendships with people who are more accepting of who we authentically are as we dig more and more into our inner world. And so over time, we can start to internalize what it feels like to be seen for our authentic self, to have that self get mirrored back to us by a secure other, and then that can start to be a pattern that feels familiar. And I just wanted to take a moment with that because I think that this is something that gets thrown out there a lot that can make us feel kind of hopeless. That idea that we don't seek out what we want, we seek out what is familiar. Because it's so unconscious and it's so true, that can leave us with the feeling of, well, no matter what I do, I'm just never gonna find what I want because my system is always going to be operating unconsciously in a way that sabotages me but I just want to point out that we can change what feels familiar through putting ourselves in new experiences where we establish a new normal that our body starts to recognize. And we're going to get more into how to do the work around all of this and how to start choosing more compatible partners after this one last point, which is that in insecure partnerships, what's often happening is each person is keeping themselves feeling important by solving each other's problems. So the more anxious person tends to be over-functioning in the area of emotional expression and kind of providing the emotional glue that keeps the partnership together. And the more avoidant partner tends to be over-functioning in the area of emotional regulation and being kind of sturdy and solid enough for both of them. But in a secure partnership, it's not at all about solving each other's problems. It's about enjoying each other's problems, which might seem like a kind of funny thing to say, but I think that what most people don't realize is that the people who are happiest in their lives are not people who have a perfect life 
or perfect relationships. It's just people who choose problems to struggle with that they genuinely enjoy. And the same is true when we are picking our partners. We are never going to be able to solve somebody else's life for them, nor should we be trying to do that. That's what codependency looks like. But when we go into partnerships from a secure place, what we're looking at is what type of a person do I want to support in life? Who do I want to be rooting for in a very personal and involved way? Probably someone who chooses problems to tackle with their life that you find intrinsically interesting. So this is where we go from trying to complete each other to trying to complement each other and keep one another company as we journey through life side by side. So let's say you have an insecurely attached couple where one person feels very competent and confident in their worldviews. They have an idea that this is how the world works. I have an answer for everything and I'm happy to share it. And then another person who tends to distrust the way that they look at and make sense of the world. So one worldview is kind of answering or doing away with the need to further examine the other. Versus in a more secure dynamic, you're going to have two people whose viewpoints are always changing and always growing and expanding, but who just enjoy co-regulating around it. So who enjoy coming to each other and going, I think this, what do you think? And there's usually mutual respect and humility for each other because they have intentionally selected someone whose ability to reason and whose ability to show up emotionally, they have genuine respect for. So they've probably picked someone who is interested in having the same types of conversations and spending time with the same types of existential questions that they like to spend time with. Because at the end of the day, that's all that compatibility is really about, right? What do we like to think about? How do we like to spend our time? How do we like to spend our resource? So money, energy, time, and how do we like to relate to each other? So what we're gonna move into next is a bit of exploration around how we can move from this first column, if this is where we predominantly find ourselves, into the second one, where we are choosing partners who we actually feel aligned with and who we're deeply compatible with. The first thing we need to do is go all the way back to that beginning of the cycle where we learn to disconnect from our authentic selves and we need to get back in connection with that person the person we were before all of the shame and all of the conditioning took over our personality. So some questions we really want to spend time with are questions like, who am I when I am alone with myself? When I am completely left to my own devices, what types of thoughts do I tend to have? What am I interested in? What excites me? Where does my attention naturally wander? And if this is really challenging for you to think about, or perhaps your answer is, oh, my attention just wanders to what kind of partner I would like, I want to invite you to think about the question a little bit differently. Imagine you were never going to find a partner. You could peer into a crystal ball right now and know without a shadow of a doubt, because you are seeing the entire rest of your life play out, that no matter what you do, you will be alone. Ask yourself, in that situation, what would I do? What would I devote my life to? What job would I work? What social networks would I build? What would become incredibly important to me if I knew for sure that my entire rest of my life was going to be only focused on me and my interests? The things that arise out of this question are likely to be things that genuinely interest and excite the most authentic version of you. And that's the version of you that ironically needs to be brought into the dating world the most. Or you might be on the opposite side of this spectrum. So you might actually have a fairly strong idea of who you are and what your interests and values are, but you might have this idea that if you showed that to someone else, they would naturally be repulsed by that. And so the question I would recommend spending some time with, if this is the case for you, is to imagine a different universe where exactly who you are is the most societally celebrated and coveted type of person. So if the person you are at your core, the person who you are when you're alone with yourself, were completely and totally universally accepted, loved, and celebrated, who would that version of you look like? And how would they show up in the world? And what types of rooms would they put themselves in? 
and what types of conversations would they have? So in a world where no part of you was shame bound, how would you go about trying to make connections with other people? And this is a good example of the way you're going to need to start connecting eventually in order to find the people who you are compatible with. So I remember for myself, a big shift starting to happen when I recognized that a very core part of who I am and what I like to do with my life is, this is not going to be a shocker to anyone who's familiar with this channel, but analyze myself and other people. I love psychology. It is just a true unbridled, uncomplicated love for me. But I had some shame around that growing up. I had this idea that to be in connection with people, I had to keep things very surface level. And I had to be constantly kind of making jokes, not bothering people with intimacy, which meant not showing people my true love of analysis and psychology. So then I would find myself in partnerships with people who also did not love analysis and psychology. And then the more comfortable I would get and the more I would relax into myself and start bringing that into the relationship accidentally, the more I would get rejected or the more I would be seen as prying or as potentially criticizing the relationship dynamic when what I was actually doing was just being excited to talk about and analyze it because that is what I love to do from the absolute core of me. And when I accepted, this is just what I love and I need to be seeking out intimate connections with people who also love this, my entire way of relating to people drastically changed and so did my social network. And sometimes that's how it works. We arrive at these truths about ourselves that feel so obvious it's almost annoying in retrospect, but that we don't realize have become so shame bound that we have just pushed them aside for the majority of our lives. And those are the very things in a lot of cases that allow us to connect really deeply with compatible people who value the same things. So the next thing I want to bring up, and this is similar to the first question, is if you do really struggle with using relationships as a means of fulfilling your needs, ask yourself, if all of my needs were met, if I were to develop into a securely attached person, then who would I want in my life solely because I would enjoy being around them? So instead of what are my deficits and how can I balance them out interpersonally, who would I enjoy being around solely because I like them? So I kind of like to think of this as what I call the front porch test. And I think I stole this from How I Met Your Mother, actually. I believe that um, Lily Aldrin, who's a character in that show, brought this up. But it's the idea that when you're thinking of who you want to bring into your life in an intimate way, picture yourself sitting on a porch with them in your old age and ask yourself, is this someone who I'm probably still excited to just sit next to and talk with? Now that all of the trials and tribulations of our young life are over with, is this someone whose company on a core level I just genuinely enjoy or not? And this is the single biggest question that helped me personally turn around the way I looked at romantic relationships in particular. Instead of looking at who can bring what to my life and vice versa, looking at who do I like to just be with when all other needs are filled? Who do I just like spending my time with? This is important for any form of intimate connection. So partners, friends, anyone we're bringing into our life by choice. That front porch test can be a really good visualization exercise. The next question we might want to spend some time with is how do I like to give love? I like to help people go really deep with themselves and understand themselves better. But if I'm with a partner who doesn't want to do that, we're not going to be very compatible. And the same is true for any way that we really like to give love. But that's often something we don't spend a lot of time really thinking about. How do I find someone who values that which I enjoy giving and vice versa? How do I enjoy being loved? What makes me feel like another person is really seeing and getting me? And how do I go out looking for someone who naturally likes giving that thing? And again, we're not looking at this from a deficit model. So it's not, I need this thing and can't get it on my own. It's this form of companionship and love is the type that naturally enriches my life. And the last question I encourage you to spend time with is what really turns me on and excites me in a person? So where is my sense of desire oriented? And also what makes me feel really safe with a person? 
Both of those things are going to be really big non-negotiables if we want to have a relationship with someone we are actually compatible with. Those questions answer a lot about what our interpersonal values are and what it takes to make a committed relationship work long term. Now, before I end us off here, I just want to note that a lot of the things that keep us out of our authentic selves when we're in connection with other people are related to feeling a lot of shame or struggling to stay present with ourselves. So I am going to link a bunch of videos in the description of this one that I've made in the past that go over how to work with shame and how to get to know ourselves better so that we're able to stay more authentic with the people in our lives, both when we're forming new connections, as well as when we are dating. All right, that is all I have to say for today on this topic. As always, let me know any thoughts, feelings, questions that are coming up for you in the comment section. I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and each other, and I will see you back here again really soon. Oh.